them to 150 days in jail. I mean, what does that accomplish? Obviously, this has been a uh, maybe career killer. Certainly hasn't helped him. I, I mean, to me, it sounds like there's some mental illness going on. He needs some mental health. I know he's saying he's innocent. Um, I think this is a pretty solid case against him. But be that as it may, I mean, jail time, 150 days. I mean, I, I just don't see what that what they gained. He's a He's a superstar. They could get more from him doing good works with the community and helping children, helping other people and going to speaking and lecturing all over the country and teaching than they are going to get from sitting in a jail cell for the next five minutes or five months. What's, what, what's that accomplished? I mean, it's outrageous. I, I, I don't I don't get it. I, if it's a, maybe it's a high profile case. The judge want to send a message about racial healing. I'm not sure how this heals. Um, you know, I, I feel terrible. I mean, he, he made a bad decision. He's guilty of it. But again, I'm sound like a broken record. Jail doesn't accomplish anything. I actually find, found it funny. His lawyer said, I don't, I don't criticize sentences, but then he said it was outrageous afterwards. So. Then he criticized the sentence. Of course, that's what lawyers yeah. do. You know that. <laughs> right. Well, you know what's interesting? I agree with you about the sentence. I didn't think he was going to get jail, but I want you to... Uh, educate our viewers about uh, the conversation you as an attorney have with your client going into a sentencing because it almost felt to me like he wasn't expecting to go away to jail certainly not today uh, I was surprised the judge didn't suspend it but I, I understood after that you know 30 minutes of uh, you know preaching to the to the court about why he was doing what he was doing but talk to me about that conversation do you think their attorneys warned him and said look you could get jail time. You might even, it's, it might even be likely you'll get jail time and you may be taken away today. Sure, it's a very common conversation we have with our clients every day. Once you get to that phase, especially the trial and you lose, you lose all control, right? So the sentence could be any range. And that's why a lot of times you see people plead guilty to things that they, they may not be guilty of because it's the loss of control. Most people rather take something they know they can live with and going to jail for five months or five years or 10 years. So we do have those conversations, but when you want to go to trial, you've already made a decision, you, you can live with the outcome. And certainly I'm sure the lawyers never thought, and they stated that in their interviews, that he would get five months in jail because that seemed outside the, what called the heartland, the norm of sentences in Illinois and probably with this judge. And uh, I think uh, the, the lawyers said it great. I mean, they had impactful mitigation and apparently it didn't make a difference. Yeah, and I also didn't like, Michael, how the judge talked about, well, the wheels of justice turn slowly, but sometimes a hammer comes down. Mm -hmm. The hammer's coming down. That's not really, in my opinion, what the judge is there for. I mean, I get the judge has to sentence people and people deserve, some, some people deserve punishment. There's no doubt mm -hmm. about it. But the hammer's coming down. This is a guy who's not gonna flee. He showed up to court every time. The judge could have given him bail pending appeal. Um, and stay the sentence, which is what the lawyer asked for. So I don't get it. Again, sometimes these cameras do things to people and uh, they, their you know attitudes what, Lawrence, change. And I agree with you 100%. And I think it goes back to the very, the very beginning when the judge started. He mentioned how much work was put into this case, that it went on and on. And he seemed to be blaming the defense for all the different motions that they put in and all the different things that they put everyone through and the fact that the special prosecutor put in all this time working for free and I think this was part of that, you know, going in and saying, you know, this, the wheels of justice turn slowly, guys, and, and part of that was your fault, but here are the hammers. We're not doing any more of this stuff, et cetera, et cetera. So I think part of that had to do with it. But hold on a sec. I want to move on here and take a listen to some of these character witnesses. Judge James Lynn heard several character witnesses who took the stand to plead for leniency in sentencing and also heard several letters read by attorneys from some pretty big names in the social justice and entertainment world. Now, it's difficult to gauge whether or not that worked in his favor. He read them actually before he went to court. So let's listen to some of the big names that came forward in his defense and how the judge reacted. I know that Justice Millett grew up knowing to be sensitive to matters about racial discrimination, any kind of discrimination, any kind of social injustice. And as a matter of fact, I'm learning more about it uh, as we're going on in the letters I've been receiving and the testimony I've heard today. I also have a letter here from... Uh, Latanya and Samuel L. Jackson. It's very short, so. Check. Judge, if you'll indulge me for a moment, I'd like to uh, read a letter from the uh, Rainbow Push Coalition. 
that was submitted in support of our claim. Your Honor, I have a letter from Lauren Caseberg on behalf of the Illinois Innocence Project. So with the court's indulgence, I have two letters. The first is from Oscar-nominated winner of four primetime Emmys and two Grammys and political activist, Alfre Woodard. So the last letter is from Derek Johnson, who is the president and chief executive officer of the NAACP. He's been doing this all his life. He doesn't just talk the talk. He's walking the walk. He's out there. He's advocating. He's involved in the community. He cares deeply about social justice issues. And for you now to sit here convicted of hoaxing hate crimes, racial hate crimes, and homophobic hate crimes, the hypocrisy is just astounding. Viewers online and the folks who, you know, watch and then go online, chimed in on a, a, that lengthy list of letters. Some of them, like Sean Wyatt, question how big groups like the Innocence Project were able to support Smollett after he was found guilty. That's really, really interesting. All right. Still with me, criminal defense attorney and president of past president, excuse me, of the Georgia Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, Lawrence Zimmerman. Lawrence, you know, that's a big question. I, I've come across a lot of my friends and I have been talking about this. You know, all the law, big names, social justice organizations that put their name behind this guy. Obviously, he did a lot of good works in the community. But I tell you what, the evidence at this trial was, was pretty strong that this was a hoax. And a jury decided that that, in fact, was the case. They heard his story. He got up there. The judge talked about the fact he must have perjured himself, obviously. Your thoughts on all these folks putting their name behind Jesse Smollett and what this all means for them? Well, I'll say a few things. Number one, I am a strong believer that a person's worst day shouldn't define their entire life. And so Jesse Smollett sounds like, and I don't really follow him or know him other than this case, sounds like he's lived a life where he's done a lot of good deeds and helped a lot of people. So that just speaks volumes. That's probably why most of these people stood by him and said, you know, we're going to, we're not going to condone what you did. We're not accepting what you did, but all the good deeds you've done for us and through the community and for social justice certainly outweigh these very bad decisions you made for whatever reasons. And again, like I said before, maybe they all acknowledge there must be something going on mental, mentally. But the other thing, and I don't know, it's a sort of a very careful line you have to walk. I'm not so sure how well it plays out that Samuel Jackson um, wrote a letter. Somebody else of, I can't even hear it, Oscar was made as Forrest Whitaker, Oscar nominated fame. Another famous actor, another famous actor, Jesse Jackson, uh, Rainbow Push Coalition. I'm not so sure, is that impactful because they're big names or not impactful? I mean, it's a very, it's a very tight, they call it, it's like a tightrope. Do you want to throw those people out there or would you rather have maybe everyday people like you and I, Michael, writing letters on your behalf, how you've impacted their daily life? Now, I like the Innocence Project because they help free the wrongfully convicted. So that's pretty big if he's contributed to that. But I'm just saying, I'm not so sure how it helps if you have a famous actor writing a letter. Absolutely. Um, As a matter of fact, I agree with you and think it might have worked against him. Because at least part of what the judge said, Lawrence, was, you know, you have all the privilege in the world. You're connected with all these incredible people. There is no excuse for you to do what you did unless, you know, you just went off on some tangent because you're a narcissist, et cetera, et cetera. So I think, I think you're exactly right. And that part of the defense's presentation might have been tone deaf. I agree. I agree. And, you know, it's... It's tough because maybe, hey, maybe the judge loves Pulp Fiction, and so he'll love to hear, uh, you know, Samuel Jackson writing a letter in support. But again, it can also backfire. Maybe it did here, but the lawyers did as, as good a job as they could, and I still think it's outrageous how much time he got. And, and let me just also um, mention this: the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, which I'm on that board, has been talking for years about the trial penalty. A person has a constitutional right to have a trial and make the government prove that they're guilty. A person shouldn't be sentenced to more time because they exercise a constitutional right as opposed to taking a resolution without a trial. And that's what makes me upset because this judge is like the wheels of justice turn slowly. Now I'm gonna hammer you because you wasted people's time. That's their job. The job is to prosecute cases. They're there every day regardless. So what, a special prosecutor took the case on for free? All right, well now he has a lot of uh, fame because he's uh, he had a big case on court TV. So I don't buy that. I think that's disingenuous. I think it's wrong to penalize people for exercising their constitutional rights. I could not agree with you more, and this is one of those shows where I'm agreeing with you, Lawrence. I've always had a problem with what, what, what I call the trial tax. 
that the system imposes. They'll give you a deal for 10 years, but if you go to trial and, and try to say that I'm innocent of this crime or you can't prove that I'm guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, then you're going to get hit with 25, 30 years. Well, what changed between when you were willing to offer my client 10 years to after he exercises his rights, now it's worth 25 to 30 years because we made the system do its job Always had a problem with that, Lawrence. Couldn't agree with you more. All right, stand by. We're going to take a break. Coming up next. We